And now, why you're actually here, not listening to me. So, um, next up is Gordon Jones, uh, who we've known at Extension Engine for quite some time. Like I said, right now he's the founding dean, College of Inter Innovation and Design here at BSU. Um, he was the head of the Harvard iLab, like I said earlier, uh, when we, when uh, before my time there. So I actually didn't know him, but everyone said nothing but nice things about about Gordon. Uh, at least that's what I'll say right now. Um, looking, uh, hearing the stories, all the things that he's done. Uh, certainly, he has these sort of themes going through his career. Uh, he's he's uh, some people would say bicoastal, others would say maybe ambicoastal. If you know Zoolander, um, <laughs> with time on time at uh, Brown and Harvard and Stanford, and now here uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but with all his work in innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, education, and then mentorship. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say tonight to us. So, let's give Gordon a, a nice round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Okay. Well, um, I appreciate the introduction. I'm really, uh, I'm really excited to be here. Sorry, I'm just trying to get this battery clipped. Uh, I was thinking coming to talk to this group of technologists and technology experts, and uh, and I have no slides, no multimedia, nothing. So I don't know if that immediately makes me a fraud or uh, or excites you because uh, whether you're overstimulated from your day or not, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I do, um, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you, Anna, for this invitation. And uh, my goal tonight is to share with you remarks that really reflect my view on um, the, the uh, issues that I think are affecting higher ed. I embedded in that, I'd love to share with you some of the things that I'm doing here in the College of Innovation and Design. And I believe it is a unique structure and I'll share with you why that is. I think what gets me excited about speaking tonight is one, I think this is a group who I'm speaking to the choir. And I think that we are a group that is most likely predispositioned to much of the perspective that, um, hopefully much of the perspective, but certainly uh, the perspectives that I see in higher ed. And I also think too that this is a group that has the skills and the focus to have tremendous impact on this industry. And I believe that uh, the next 10 and 20 years is gonna be a very interesting time to be in higher education. And I think it's gonna play out in the schools that are represented in this room more than it is in places like Harvard of my past or Scott, your background at even a University of Michigan. Uh, because this is where many of the trends that I think are going on are being impacted. So uh, again, as Scott said, I'm fairly recent to Boise and Boise State. I do come from Harvard, but um, I come having participated in an experience at Harvard that was um, orthogonal to the structure and the tradition of the university. And the Harvard Innovation Lab, um, just as a brief preamble, is really about bringing together in a very distributed and uh, uh, um, distributed structure a single place for co-curricular cross-disciplinary learning, uh, faculty engaged, student-centered, and that really whet my appetite for saying where in this industry is transformation occurring. And I got very excited at what I saw happening at Boise State. Um, many of these things may exist in your universities too, but I got captivated by Boise State. And people will often ask me, why would you? Uh, why did you leave Harvard and come to Boise State? And I won't go into all the reasons, but I would just say the summary, I find there's a culture at this university that's about, it's focused on how do we make history. And I believe in many places, perhaps the place where I came from, which I do hold near and dear, but it is a, a storied institution that's not shy about telling you that it was founded pre uh, predating the formation of the United States, 379 years old, and a lot of great people before you. So don't try to believe that you are gonna move the needle too much. In fact. I got an email the other day from a faculty member 
at one of Harvard's schools, and he said, hey, we miss you, but um, um, I can assure you that much like the glacier, since you've left, Harvard's moved about four feet. And so I felt good to know that uh, not much has changed. But I would open, actually, my, my um, talk tonight with some quotes, quotes that are motivating to me and certainly, I think, frame my mind and hopefully yours. First of all, I think of these things. Um, in 1943, Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM, predicted at that time that he thought there was a global market for five computers, as he's quoted as saying. 1928, Harry Warner, founder of Warner Films, declared famously or infamously, who the hell wants to hear actors talk, right? We have Charlie Chaplin. In 1876, Western Union talked about this device called the telephone. We've evaluated it. It has, it's inherently has no value to us. It's more of a fad and a trinket. And we all know that that clearly was not the case. Um, perhaps more interesting, the, uh, the man credited with the experiments that led to the formation of post-it notes said, you know, if I'd thought about it, I never would have run the experiments that led me to figure out that adhesive. The literature is full of examples where this would, that you would have concluded this would never work. Yet he did it, and we know that Post-it Notes has forever plagued us in meetings since. <laughs> you know, and it, while these are maybe humorous, I think they're actually instructive and, and there's an importance behind them. First of all, I will often share those with students and I'll say, listen, nobody knew more about their industry at the time than the individuals that I just quoted. These were the experts. These were folks who had domain knowledge that exceeded anybody, I would argue, in their space. And yet, fundamentally, that's not sufficient to understand what the future will hold. And they're not clairvoyants or arbiters of truth moving forward. And I think those of us that sit on the precipice and the cusp of where can technology in particular lead us in higher ed, I think many of us in this room reflect a skill set and a perspective that may actually be able to be much more than the roles we may serve in our universities, but actually speak into the opportunities of what is ahead. I think the second point about this is that, you know, we are in a place where industries and services change over time. I think in education, we've been operating at a pace that's been effectively glacier in terms of the pace of change. But I do believe that in the future there are forces at work that are going to be accelerating the pace with which this industry uh, addresses change and the pressures on higher education to adapt. And I believe that as an industry we can either embrace these trends or, uh, and work with them, meet them head on, or I think we can ignore them at our own peril. And I do believe in an industry where there's 5,000 of us in terms of institutions out there, none of us own more than a small fraction of the students who go through, the vast majority of our institutions are picking a strategy that I call, I'm going to ignore it and I hope I don't get hit. And I'm not sure that's the language they put around it. Um, many institutions will often point to a very specific point of differentiation and say, that's, that's our key for change. We, we own, I'm making up straight up here on the dais, so whether it makes sense or not, I don't know. We have, we're the only school that offers high mountain horsemanship. You know, no, nobody offers that. And unfortunately, when you tie that to enrollments, you'll realize it's 50 to 150 students out of your 5,000, right? And what, what is really keeping the, the, the difference enrolled in your university? I think that's what I call when I say the hope you don't get hit strategy. And yet I believe it's conferences and it's groups like this that assemble they can actually be part of a minority who are saying, we're going to step into and try to work with these, uh, these trends and figure out how we're going to adapt. I think there's two macro trends that are affecting us as an industry today that are very motivating to me and are very much at the foundation of the work I do in the college that I'm leading and have, create, and have, and have uh, taken on the founding role to. The first is affordability in education. We know since 94, tuitions have outstripped average household incomes by an average of 2x. Two, two, two and that is left in, the, left in our memory the days when many of us, perhaps in this room, could have spent time at our local state university and maybe spent our summers working to cover most, if not all, of our tuition. And that afforded us a broad set of choices post-university. And quite honestly, from World War II on, as many of you may know, 
You know, we had a very small fraction pre-World War II of our population that even went to university. With the GI Bill post-World War II till I would argue the mid-90s, mid, mid we've developed a narrative that said, look, this should be available for everybody. And I think we all maybe believe that. I, I certainly do. But it came with a level of affordability that allowed that to become a no-brainer. It was a public good. And in the words of Peter Thiel, one of the co-founders of PayPal, who runs, uh, kind of hits the news a lot for his 20 under 20 program, and I'll leave that for a minute over on the side. But Peter is concerned uh, and speaks very much about affordability, and he'll often say, I'm concerned that what people bought as a public good, today we're actually making people victims because of this affordability issue. Uh, college debt today is our number one debt burden when you add up certain segments of debt that exist. And we know that that affordability issue is a concern. I believe it's really developed an economic rational mindset. I personally see, um, and I don't know if you do yourselves on your campuses, but parents, students, many folks are very clear on developing a mindset of what exactly am I getting here? And again, that's a very different question, I would argue, that pe than people asked decades ago and not too many decades such that we're all timed out in this room, certainly in our times. The second, and I believe even more relevant today, is the infusion of technology. And while many of us in this room are focused on where is technology going to impact our knowledge dissemination and how is learning taking place, which I believe is critical, I also believe equally critical, and I believe also perhaps even more flat-footed in our industry, is how is technology going to change the actual work we do to deliver to, to be a part to be to be education institutions. So not necessarily in the classroom, what's happening with the infusion of technology both inside but also outside. And I'll talk about those things. I think that the trends, that the, the implication of these trends, when you hold them up against the university and outside, I think lead to a couple observations. One is we've, we've ended up inside our universities today in a world in which I think there are structural and cultural impediments that are preventing some of the best of our universities to being brought to bear. What earned, you facul what, what earned faculty tenure 50 years ago today would be considered ridiculously broad. And yet it was that breadth that I would argue allowed for much more cross-disciplinary behaviors to take place than the incentives and where we are today. Because what earns you tenure is so much more narrow today and so much more disconnected from other disciplines and other discipline-based colleges I believe that the structure and the culture of that community is much more difficult to reach out and collaborate across those disciplines in teaching and learning, for that matter, research. I also think that uh, the idea of inquiry-based learning, learning by doing, and I also think that um, where do we in this economic rational mindset of affordability, where are we demonstrating and, t and declaring where our academic study ties to your next choice in vocation? That's very choiceful language I just used. I'm not saying where do we become vocational educators, although that may be a part. All of us in our universities, I believe, have pre-professional tracked uh, majors. That's clear, right? Like Boise State, we have nursing, social work, accounting. These are all very much aligned, yet many, many majors that don't have that, and yet we all acknowledge my English, fa you know, English faculty will often tell me, you know, look, there's a skill set we know comes from pursuing a major like that. It has dividends in vocational arenas. The trick, I would argue, in that, though, is to what degree are we just declaring that our existing curriculum is, has a dividend of those benefits versus where are we choicefully reviewing our curriculum to ensure that we can speak to those competencies that come through? Creativity, adaptability, communication, perhaps in the case of English. I wasn't an English major. But I, I will say I, I certainly value both the liberal arts as well as the pre-professional. So when I use that language about connecting to the vocational community, please know that. I also think there's implications that are affecting our universities beyond disciplines because of these trends of affordability and technology. There's the rise of alternative and substitute options to higher education. The alternative ways to be certified, right? And to develop badges, we all see them, whether they be certainly in the technical arena, the coding academies, the ways in which you can speak to competencies um, competency-based degrees. We know that some of our universities are getting connected on that, but also trends that I think really challenge our whole embodiment of higher ed. What are we going to do about lifelong learning, right? Today, we've, we have a very transactional arrangement with our students for the most part, unless you come from a university where I'm not familiar with your methodology, but we typically are today still producing diplomas, 
We're shaking hands. We're encouraging you to buy tickets to our football or basketball games. We hope our advancement folks can get you to one of our gatherings and we can engage you in those traditional mediums. Yet we know our graduates today will have, what, seven, eight different jobs, multiple careers. Where, where do we reimagine how our universities operate? How does technology enable that? What if we had lifelong admission in our universities? And we partner with you throughout your career and all of a sudden the academic counselor, the advancement and, uh, and our registrar all connect into roles that might walk the path with you and move away from focusing on credit hours to competencies perhaps and allow us to join students across that journey. I think affordability and broader access to higher education. And then the other one I think of as well is the unbundling of the relationship that we have as universities to employers. A uh, perfect example I would say today, I, I, I'm not picking on any one role, but I would certainly say a hot job that I'm not sure everybody would call out as a hot job in terms of the dynamic implications of it is the registrar. You know, today most registrars, and I'm not speaking to any one in particular, but I would bet that most would say my role is to maintain the, academic, the integrity of Gordon Jones's transcript, his record, his academic uh, records. Did he get A's in these classes or not? Perhaps I serve as an input to accreditation. And yet I would argue that much like how you frame your role, especially in the world of the technology and implication today, I think it's about Hopefully, I would, I would personally advocate it's a role where you can think about how do I more perfectly represent Gordon Jones or any other graduate of my university to speak to the kinds of experiences and perhaps competencies that they have developed in partnership with this university. And I'll tell you why I think it's important and hang with me for a minute. Because if we don't do it, I think others will. And in fact, others are already at work. Um, perhaps, how many of you are familiar with Parchment, Degreed, Credly? Anybody? So think of what, 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 what they see and realize. I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, too many employers who just rave about the university as a partner of choice for them. Um, that's meant to be humorous, so feel free to laugh, right? I mean, there's nobody doing it that I really see. There may be exceptions, a faculty member to a particular vocational group. Of course, those are there. But en masse, is that stakeholder group feeling like the university is connecting them in a meaningful way? I think uh, many of our universities do a terrific job at producing folks and putting them into roles where, frankly, it's not clear to me the investment and the time they spent earning that bachelor's was required for that role. I have a niece who went to a private university I won't mention because of the story. Uh, six months after graduation, 50% of her class, according to her, didn't have a job. My brother helped her get a job, and no sooner did she report to the university she got this job than they slapped her face up on the front cover of their career services uh, magazine, talking about what a great job their career services does at getting people placed and what wonderful destinations their graduates go. And that was fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year. So that's the private tuition story. And imagine in our larger universities how much more difficult it is to have that personal relationship. The parchment degree and Credly have figured out this whole registrar piece and said, you know what? You know, registrars, um, that's fine. I'll tell you what, students, um, send me your transcript. Send me everything else you've done, though, that can speak to your, your abilities, right? Eagle Scout, I worked on a ranch. I've developed these skills. I went to a coding academy. And they'll develop your competency scores. And more importantly, they'll step forward with employers and say, listen, why work with University X? That's a lot of time you spend out of your office interviewing people. You may even be abiding by employment rules on campus that aren't even really consistent with what you need. Parchment today, one of the co-founders of Blackboard's behind it, says, hey, I have a million profiles. I can deliver you, the employer, 20 different uh, profiles that I think would be perfect for what you're telling me this role would. And you don't, have to, you don't have to spend time out on the road doing the country doctor thing, right? Knocking on people's chests, saying, are you good enough? You know, well, you played in the marching band. I was in the chess club, and I... I got a 4-0, you know, it's like, well, okay, you know, that's, that tells me something, but it may, perhaps there's more perfect ways to determine that. And so what they understand, and the reason why this is important from my perspective is the moment employers start turning, say, hey, you guys show me your finalists for these roles. What does that do to us in higher ed? We become an input into somebody else's algorithm. And we don't have those relationships and really the ability to make transformational change because we're much more connected to the partner with whom we're working. So where does that work its way through our pedagogies, our curriculums, 
the kinds of things we can offer our students. Now, I'm having someone else declare, you know what, <clears throat> the $6,700 that a student perhaps pays at a Boise State, we're going to discount that. that. That degree is worth a 0.6 in our competency algorithm, and Wichita State's is a 1.5. And we're gonna be whipsawed as just an input into somebody else's algorithm. So if you think the US News and World Report rankings are tough for us to all swallow, imagine a world in which now people are really in that economic rational mindset I described because of this trend. Imagine the effect that can have. And I believe that, it, that that's a damaging and a negative trend development if we as universities don't think about ways in which we can engage. So whether it be inside our university or trends that step that exist on the boundaries of our institution, it's these things that really led to the formation of the college that I'm leading. It is uh, thinking of these implications that the president of Boise State, President Bob Kustra, had proposed and our state board of education authorized the formation of this college roughly a year and a half ago. I think that this is a special entity. I'm not aware of any other entity. I am a diploma granting college, and yet I'm not focused on trying to build an academic discipline. I'm not trying to speak to an academic discipline as much as I'm focused on actively thinking about where do we innovate and focus on innovating both inside and outside of our university. Most universities will either attempt to do some innovation inside a discipline-based uh, entity, your college of blank, will do have somebody who may focus on this. Yet invariably, I would argue that structure tends to suppress and conform to the, the demands of the existing discipline. Or your central administration will have somebody, and yet we know that that can be very limiting in terms of the empowerment that group may have to speak into original creation, or for that matter, let alone curriculum and student learning. So it is that focus. Our goal is to ensure, at its highest level, relevance in higher education. For students here at Boise State, our orientation is to share the insights that we have and the learnings that we have both locally, statewide, and beyond. I'm not aware of any other entity in the U.S. higher ed scene that has both this structure and empowerment, and I believe that there are hopefully folks who will, uh, will uh, uh, be advocates of this kind of structure. With this, I'd love to share with you some of the specifics. Okay, that's great. I, I hear what you're saying. I hear the trends, I hear the implications. What are some of the things we're doing? Um, I think I've structured this college in some ways that may be of interest to you, and I'll share them with you. One is, I think of it in three buckets. What are we doing to be innovating and designing? Uh, the ability for cross-disciplinary faculty who wanna work across disciplines in the development and launch of new majors, new minors, certificates, it sit across disciplinary boundaries where your normal structure would either be a long time for that to happen or might never get there. I'll give you one example. We just launched in our first fall, this past fall, a new major for students called Gaming, Interactive Media, and Mobile Technology. Sort of gaming and virtual reality for short. It's a belief that this is, un the underpinnings of it are art, psychology, and computer science. And yet, we look at that field, and I believe there's going to be a burgeoning growth and demand for that skill set. So jobs that will pay above, above normal graduate level, we, we expect that to be above our norms at Boise State. And yet again, the underpinnings of that curriculum in a traditional university, you might find that all three of those disciplines might spend time, uh, if it's really lacking constructive dialogue, you might find all three are demanding half the curriculum, which we can do the math, right? Three players, each demanding half, that's a problem. Or you may find that this, the structural impediments of the university just don't even allow for that to develop. And yet very quickly that major came together. We had 60 freshman majors last fall going through this year. We're expecting to have 200 freshmen and sophomores. The ability to be more nimble, so that's one of the other benefits you're seeing by a structure like this is, can we actually act in months and weeks and months more than semesters and years, which is perhaps your traditional higher ed clock, to quote Michael Crow at Arizona State. We have also other faculty, I'm giving you examples, I have faculty in our answer, so many of the liberal arts folks will say, hey, where can our, uh, where can we get more deliberate about designing and showcasing the skill sets? So I'll give you an example, I have a faculty member, department chair of anthropology, saying, I believe that this skill set has tremendous application in a professional environment. Where can we work? We're developing what's called a professional ethnography degree. 
the ability to adapt the techniques of the anthropologist to a professional community that is demanding where, where is it that we can be synthesizing human behavior? Where, where do we develop the observation and the clinical skills to understand human behavior, but also then to interpret and recommend the kinds of innovations, whether that be process, product, that can ensure changed behavior. Professional ethnographers today, City of Tacoma hires them to look and evaluate how can we minimize pesticide runoff that goes into our streams. That's an evaluation and looking at where people uh, uh, apply lawn-based uh, pesticides or fertilizers. Where do the professional community do it? Not just observing and, and forensically categorizing, but also saying what is it gonna take to change those behaviors? We see it happening in the professional community, Fed FedEx, is saying we have hundreds of employees at our headquarters who are making large decisions in designing distribution centers. And yet they have no real real understanding in our shipping centers. We have no real understanding of the human behaviors that go into the usage and utilization of those spaces and yet big implications. Yet I have people in Memphis or in our headquarters where we design these things without, with more of a forensic quantitative analysis rather than the, the, the input that comes with the qualitative insight of perhaps a professional ethnographer. That individual is able to really understand how we, how you should be thinking about the behaviors that go on in those places and be able to infuse those back into the decisions. And I'm just giving you two examples. It goes down the list from Silicon Valley to General Electric, all the way down to your civic and municipal governments. These are places where we observe this fusion of disciplines and the adapt adaptations. And as a college, we're able to act more nimbly and adaptively to sponsor those things. We also are working in the non-degree credentialing and skill acquisition space. My view on this is if we're gonna watch the rise of whether it be coding academies or others, understand that's a group that's targeting not just coding, of course that's, a that's an area where people are hiring, but make no mistake, you talk to Jake Schwartz at a General Assembly, you talk to the founders of Galvanize out of Denver, and many of them may be approaching you, they're run down the list, they're all dead set focused on finding alternative paths to many professional fields that step outside, not just step outside the technology arena. And their goal ultimately is to become a substitute credential. And I do believe that our role goes far beyond credentialing into the transformational experience that comes with college. And I do believe that value is much bigger than zero. And yet in many cases we stand flat footed as we watch the rise of that. So my view is we need to actually get embrace it. The answer I would argue is to get closer to it and figure out how we might experiment and think about how we bring it in-house rather than say, let these dichot this dichotomy rise up. So we're focused on, we've launched elective courses called Bridge to Career. We're allowing students from any discipline. You wanna be a history major, you wanna be English, you wanna be actually an engineer, that's fine. We have a veneer of a la carte electives that are focused on guaranteeing you some basic fluency in a professional skill or some industry awareness. You can assemble those. We don't necessarily put a recognized badge to them, but you can assemble them that will more perfectly present yourself to where you're trying to go. So you, maybe you're an education major, but you take our basics of coding because your interest is in education technology. And maybe we don't have an education technology. I think at Boise State we actually do, but my point is that you would then be able to then say, when you're interviewing, instead of being one of 100 education majors, you're able to say, well, let me explain where my course of study and some of the work that I've done, and in our cases, there's a lot of project-driven work, can speak to the authenticity of my desire to move in that direction. So it's a more perfect, it's a baby step towards some of this representation of our skills and competencies. We have Venture College for a very specific set of our students who are innovators. We believe every student should be able to apply the ideas they're learning in the classroom. Some of them want to really run with this. We aggregate resources and open them up to skill development workshops. There's no credit involved. We have over 500 students who are spending time in these places where they're actually running with their own ideas. Some of them may vocationally turn those into a role and a job. Most of them won't, but they're developing skills around creativity, tenacity, adaptability. It's community engagement around mentoring of these projects and ideas. They come from all different disciplines. They make a tremendous employee because they've actually lived their own ideas and in a less clinical environment or sterile environment of a classroom. And I find students today are, ru are running to those kinds of experiences. We're building in our college, many of you may have some of these things, co-ops, we are doing summer coding academy, short courses. 
I'm very focused on the idea of custom degrees, stackable certificates as well. And then lastly, the third area we're focused on is where do we engage our community in new embodiments? We as universities are looking at students today or potential students who may not have the luxury of life stage or may not have the geography to step onto our campuses. Certainly distance learning through technology is a critical component for making that happen. But at the same time, I think there's another level of conceiving, not only that that happens, but how does it happen that can create, open up greater opportunities for greater, opportunities for greater numbers to participate. Two examples, we're working with employers to say, where do we partner with you through employee benefits such that you can offer your current employees and you pay for them to come and finish that bachelor's degree that your student, that your employee is not finished. And we will bring alongside you the kind of coaching that will ensure the kind of finishing rates and your employees are able to pursue a, a, a virtually unlimited number of concentrations as part of that degree acquisition, which will open up your employees. So then now the story is not just distance learning, that's great, individuals can sign up for that from lots of places, but when it's in the context of an employer where you may have a career, we understand our employers love that because it's reduced turnover. We also know our employees love it because now I may be able to prepare myself for a different role inside an organization while I'm building a career. We have some employers here in the Treasure Valley where you can stay with them still for 30 years. I know that's a little different for many of us from some other cities where employers are turning over, but certain industries, the grocery industry being one, where you can still go from the back room to the, to the executive suite. Um, another one is the idea of employer university. We've embodied with one of our employers, we're exploring the idea of what if we put our university inside your employer and make it an employer university. Your employees can stay. They don't even, will co-create the pedagogy that will allow them to earn the badges and certificates. Never even hits our registrar, but they can manage their career embedded in your employment. Sort of a powered by Boise State employer you model. Those are things we're experimental on. The design of the college that I oversee on everything I just said to you is about launching and nurturing and validating and the way this college is structured is that when things have recognized validity, I spin them out because I want to be catalytic and encourage the kinds of transformation. We're trying to live more nimbly. So that gaming, interactive media, mobile technology major, that's one that someday will live either in our arts and sciences college or our engineering. And they're going to love it because it's going to have 400 students producing 100 graduates every year. And in the way we do our budgeting, that will actually spin off extra extra resources that my colleagues, deans, and other colleges will be able to use for their own purposes in building faculty cap capabilities or student opportunities. So I think that while there's 5,000 of us out there, uh, I believe that our ability as individual institutions, it's not just what I'm doing at Boise State, and I hope it's not just what you're doing in your universities. We're models and we're canvases upon which we're hopefully empowered in our own way. I'm in my role, you're all in your roles. Where can we be launching our own experiments? Micro perhaps at some levels, macro at others, that we can share with each other because many people would look at our industry and say, wow, these, these folks are living exclusively by the regulatory, uh, the regulatory fence that preserves their existence. The day in which you know, federal financial aid dollars get opened to broader sets of folks and employers go somewhere else, that's a, that's a, be a negative development for the ways in which we operate. And my hope is that we can serve as innovators, large and small, for our industry, for each other, and try to share those as an open playbook. And this is a very special opportunity. And again, I hope that, uh, again, I feel like I'm speaking to the, the choir here, so to speak. And, um, and I wanna um, encourage all of us to do our part. So with that, thank you very much. Um, I hope that this conference serves as a way in which there's cross-pollination, germination, and uh, the ability to continue to innovate. And so I appreciate Anna and the committee that invited me to come and share my remarks. And again, thank you very much.